Welcome to Rio Plus Social. We are so happy to have you here today, everywhere in this room in Rio de Janeiro, watching across the world via live stream on YouTube. To everyone, to all of our friends, we'd like to say welcome to the most important conversation happening in the world today. My name is Aaron Sherinian. I'm with the United Nations Foundation. And on behalf of our partners, a group of extraordinary people and organizations that believe that today in a connected world, in a world where technology can be used for good, in a place where global problems can only be solved when we work together, and in a day in a city where everyone is talking about the future we want, together with the United Nations and world leaders, this is your seat at the summit. This is your time to have your voice heard with Rio Plus Social. You know, today is going to be a different kind of event because it's a different kind of conversation. And I want to make sure that you know what to expect as we go through today's interesting conversations because you're a part of that conversation. It's going to be fast. There's going to be changes. We want you to, to remember to be part of a conversation that's happening via social media all over the world. We want you to ask the questions. We're listening to you. And so are the speakers. So are the leaders of the UN and from throughout the world that are meeting for Rio Plus 20 here today. So please use the hash Rio Plus Social hashtag on Twitter. Please update and post on your Facebook pages things that you're learning about. Please put on your blogs those questions and things that you want to hear about and pin what you are finding interesting. We're listening to you and we'll make sure that your voice is part of that conversation. Today you're not going to hear a lot of introductions because you have the information online on realplussocial.com. You have the information in your bloggers packet. So we're going to make sure we start the conversations early and we'll get right down to the, to the real business of how social media is at the heart of helping make sure that we solve the world's uh, biggest problems and create a better world. But you're going to see two guys. And they're these two guys right here that we're going to uh, introduce to you right now. You're going to see Lucas Mello and Rodrigo Cunha, Rodrigo Cunha from Live. You're going to see these two faces. They're going to be coming up and introducing our speakers, our conversations, and our panels as they come in. So thanks, guys, for being here today. And speaking of Lucas and Rodrigo, they are part of a dynamic group of partners that I want to make sure and shout out to today. It's only thanks to our partners that we're able to stand here in Rio de Janeiro today in support of the UN's conversation with global leaders about global issues, sustainability, and a better future. I'd like to thank, uh, in particular, Ericsson, who has made all of this possible today, an organization that understands how technology can be used for good. And in our world today, as a networked society, technology for good is the conversation starter. Is Hans Vestberg here right now? I understood he might be here with us today. And do I have friends from Ericsson who are here today? I want to say, hi. Hans, say hi to everybody. Hans is here. We're going to hear from Hans later on today. Thank you, Ericsson, for being a leader. And our friends from EDP, a leader in sustainable energy. Do we have friends here from EDP already? I want to make sure that you know who they are. Can we please give a round of applause to our dynamic sponsors who have made this possible today? Thanks to all of you. Now, of course, you know that the partners who bring you the Social Good Summit and here in Rio, Rio Plus 20, we, uh, we're proud of the fact that the conversation just got started. And I want to make sure that you all have a chance to meet uh, our dear friend, Pete Cashmore of Mashable. Pete, are you around in this room right now? Have we got you here, Pete? Pete's in the back. And what I'd like everyone to do right now is I want you all to like Pete Cashmore. You know how you do that? We're all going to actually give him a thumb. So if you can all do me a favor and like Pete Cashmore for you. I like you, Pete. We're liking Pete Cashmore. We go, thank you, Pete. Thank you to Mashable. And to the 92nd Street Y, you're going to hear from, as we start the conversation, our partner, Henry Timms. As a reminder, we are all part of that story because we're talking about sustainability. Abril, the Abril Group, and the Planeta Sustentable, we want to make sure and thank our friends who are driving this conversation here in this country that is hyper-vocal and hyper-social and that is leading the world in sustainability issues. Virgin Unite, who will be here later on as well. All of these friends are people we want you to follow, ask questions to. Now, it is my pleasure to get the conversation started. We're going to have a dynamic start to our morning, led by our, uh, our friended partner, Henry Timms of the 92nd Street Y, who's going to start us off today. Let's give him a hand and welcome them. Henry. We're ready for it, right? Thank you, everybody. 
Good morning and welcome to Rio Pastel Show. It's a real pleasure to be here this morning. So we thought we'd start the day by getting right into it. We've got with us two real leaders in the sustainability space, both of whom run global organizations. Both those organizations are all about Rio, are all about sustainability, but are also all about some of the big challenges we're facing. So in the next 20 minutes, with Georg Kell and with Kumi Naidu, we're going to answer a big question, which is really, what is this all about? So let's get straight into it. Here's my first question. There's 130 heads of states here in Rio right now. There's 50,000 people. What are we all doing here? Kumi. Well, what we are supposed to be doing here is securing the future of our children and grandchildren, if you want to put it in very simple terms. That this planet was recognized 20 years ago has certain limitations in terms of what we take from it and how we ensure that we sustain it for future generations. So this summit is about, was supposed to be about, protecting our oceans, protecting our forests, ensuring that people, the 1.6 billion people in the world who do not have access to a single light bulb, have energy access, but to have it in a clean, green way. It's about rethinking the model of development that we've had historically that has drove us to this point of climate catastrophe and destruction and to ask ourselves, how do we have a new green inclusive economy that can help people out of poverty to live decent prosperous lives, but to do it in a way that also does not harm the environment and does it in a sustainable way for future generations. So I think there's a so, lot Sorry, I, I should say though, that's what we were supposed to do. But if I want to be brutally honest, and I feel that's my job to do that. Very good. Is that what is happening there, the negotiations went on till about two, three in the morning last night. The text on the table is a pathetic disgrace. It's a betrayal of what this is supposed to be about. And if anything, soon we will be calling this conference if the heads of state do not reverse what's on the table, not Rio plus 20, but Rio minus 20, because it's taking us more than 20 years back. Thank you. I, I think that qualifies as brutal honesty. So, Georg, give us your spin on this. Why are we here, and is, are we being brutally honest about this? Is that really where we are right now? I think Kumi got it right. We are here to look for new pathways that are sustainable. Uh, one billion people without food going hungry every night, one billion people lacking access to water, clean water, clean energy. At the same time, the planet is set on the wrong direction, global warming, it's a reality. It's, we're building a huge problem for the future. Governments know it, they're trying to negotiate their way into the future. This is tough, it is not easy. More than 190 governments with different perspectives but what's also going on here in Rio, and this is why the social summit is so important, because sustainable development is everybody's business. So I believe that Rio is also, and probably foremost, about changing mindsets on a very large scale. Consumers, young people, business, and other actors, academia, because we need to change. We need to find new ways of what we produce, how we produce, and how we find ways to include those which are excluded. So I would say Rio Plus 20 has at least two tracks, if not three. It has the government tracks, it has the non-government track, and within the non-government track, there are basically all stakeholders of society. And that's why I think Rio Plus 20 goes beyond governments. Are we pleased? The Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said, Negotiations are painfully slow. And that's a diplomatic word of saying much more should be done. Absolutely. What can we do? I think we have to encourage governments to do more. We have to rebuild bottom up the imperative of making change faster and for scaling up. And I think all of us as consumers, as citizens, as business people, as entrepreneurs, as think tanks, we all have a role to play in that. So that's the, the big picture, and it's a pretty depressing big picture. So tell me about your organizations. W what are you doing here in Rio, and what does success look like for your organizations? Well, I'm running a business civil society organization. It's called Global Compact. 
10 principles, universal principles, human rights, workplace, the environment, and good governance, anti-corruption, very important. Many of the malaise in the world, by the way, I believe, have to do with the abuse of power, which skews incentives and holds back the inclusion of people. Uh, we have 7,000 companies and 2,000 civil society organizations organized in country networks around the world. And we had a three-day event here in this very same hotel, just which concluded yesterday, where we basically tried to build bottom-up solutions on water management, on low-carbon technology, on social entrepreneurship, on human rights, supply chain, and many other issues. And we tried to build the business case for sustainability. The good news is a growing number of companies is getting more serious, but the bad news is the great majority is still sitting on a fence and is reluctant to invest into corporate sustainability. So my personal hope is that out of Rio and with the help of the opinion makers, we will create incentives and yes, pressure to accelerate uh, corporate sustainability so that the majority of companies actually embraces green, clean, inclusive growth so that chambers of commerce become chambers of sustainability. Nice. Kumi. Greenpeace is here in several of the three tracks that George mentioned. Uh, we have a team that's inside the formal negotiations where we are lobbying different country delegations on different areas of the uh, conversation around oceans, around uh, sustainable energy, uh, green economy, and so on. But we have decided to put more of our energy in the People Summit, where we are hosting a range of different activities, using this opportunity to build alliances with faith leaders, with indigenous peoples, with women's movements, and so on. Because we never came to Rio thinking that in three days, we will find the solution to the world we want. We knew that the struggle would continue, and we're seeing this as a basis for ongoing um, work. We also connected with a, a lot of people around the world. Yesterday, uh, together with 350.org and a range of other groups, we did a Twitter storm. You might have seen this. One of the terrible ironies and one simple thing that governments could do is at the moment, Governments spend several hundred billion dollars of taxpayer money in what are called fossil fuel subsidies that go to oil, coal, and gas companies. And already three years ago, the G20 agreed that they would scrap them. But up to now, they have not made one step in that direction. And so we ran this thing yesterday on Twitter, uh, calling on people to participate around the world calling on governments to actually move away from um, the fossil fuel subsidies. And uh, I maybe should extend the invitation to those of you who are here in Rio. We also have our ship, the Rainbow Warrior, um, in Rio, and people are invited to come and uh, visit it. Just to show how mad governments can sometimes be, I'd like to remind you that the French government sent intelligence agents to bomb that earlier version of the ship in Auckland Arbor 26 years ago. Um, and so we're very proud of a ship that still stands. Uh, uh, well, it's not the same one. Uh, and, and, and the other thing that will happen tomorrow will be a big march through the streets of uh, Rio, where we hope to bring urgency and, and more ambition to the political leaders in the final days of the negotiations. So, so talk for a minute about the Twitter storm yesterday, which is a you know, really interesting thing for you guys to be doing. How do you know if that's working? You know, one of the challenges with social media is we see that the criticism is it's a lot of noise, not a lot of action. That's always a criticism. Tell us how you're taking that on, in the sense yesterday you engaged a whole bunch of people around the world, but how is the world different today? Well, I think firstly, a lot of people in the world didn't know that in fact our governments use taxpayer money in subsidies to actually fund harmful energy options. If that same money would go to renewable energy, we could have a seismic shift in terms of the problem. So what we saw, the way you measure it in a way, is um, the numbers of people. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I don't know offhand right now how large, 
uh, it broke various records by the end of yesterday. Um, then we also try to consciously uh, build in creative elements where people can take their own actions. So we advise people of how they could take the broad sort of message, design their own ads and so on. And people uh, I've seen on my Facebook page, for example, various uh, people doing it. I mean, you know, the, just to make a broader point about how one thinks about social media and conventional activism. Uh, you know, some people say, well, you know, online activism or cyber activism is actually slacktivism. You know, that people just are sitting there and going, clicking buttons and so on. Now, I just would say that if you are doing online activism in Syria or if you're doing it in Egypt, nobody could actually accuse you of doing slacktivism, right? You were using it. But I do think the challenge, which is in your question, is how do you connect online and offline activism? So I can give you uh, many examples of how Greenpeace does it in the sense that we can initiate a campaign. For example, right now we have uh, a campaign against Kentucky Fried Chicken for buying their packaging from newly deforested timber in the Indonesian rainforest. And so there's various online actions that people can take. And, but there's also a recommended set of actions that people can volunteer. Even people who are not directly connected with Greenpeace can actually take. So people have been going and painting outside KFC stores in Holland, for example, uh, a tiger, uh, t tiger shapes, because one of the implications of the Indonesian rainforest destruction is the extinction of the Sumatran tigers. So just to give you an example, you have to have, I think, an a, a offline conventional way so that those with power can actually feel uh, pressure to change. So I want to come back to Greenpeace in a minute, but, but Georg, you wrote a really interesting piece in the Herald Tribune in the run-up to Rio, all about what we're trying to do and what we're going to get done, and there was a line in that which I thought was really important, where you talked about the influence of social media narrative on big business. So to flip it to the other side, how is social media changing the lives of the people you work with every day? It is quite a lot. I, business has totally shifted attention to social media. Social media means young future consumers, opinion makers in the making, uh, a huge shift towards attention on social media. I also believe that and uh, social media is very important in creating awareness and spreading knowledge and being the entry point for something. Uh, I'm struck often that uh, the world is, is sleeping at the wheel because we all know that we are heading towards uh, huge disruptions in many ways. We also know that in politics we are probably not going in the right direction. Governments are constrained. They're busy with crisis management. There is what you could call an absence of long-term forward-looking opinion making. And uh, I hope that multilateral cooperation will soon overcome that big gap. And I hope that people everywhere will feel that it's important again to build what connects us. That's what multilateralism ultimately is about. We are currently going in a very dangerous direction, a kind of selfish, inward-oriented behavior, uh, both, I would argue, at the individual level, but also at the nation-state level, defines the course of action. And we forget about what connects us, the planet, the natural resources, but also the ability to create wealth and to include the poor in the marketplace. The multilateral trade is in a deep freezer. Nobody seems to worry. That, to me, is extremely worrisome. It means the world is hopefully not repeating the mistakes of history that led to disasters, but we are certainly going in a direction that is not stressing the importance of investing in what connects us. Increasingly, you hear voices of division, populism, inward orientation. Walls are being built instead of tearing them down. So I'm also concerned about the overall direction. And there, I hope that social media will create awareness and connect, because in the end, it's about building bridges between nations, people, private sector, civil society, because in the end we need cooperation. Without collaboration and cooperation at all levels, we cannot make the quantum leap we need to make. So tell me about the developing world, because you, you spoke about that, which is we think a lot about the social media narrative and we think a lot about Rio. How is it we make sure the developing world is part of that conversation? Well, already it is. I mean, 
our own organization, we are thriving uh, in all emerging markets. And actually, uh, a lot of innovation also has shifted uh, from traditional centers to the east, to the south. Uh, the beauty with technology is, is the diffusion of knowledge and the lowering of barriers. And that is true on technology, on access to information. When I was an engineer in Tanzania, uh, guiding young engineers, and together we built up something uh, 35 years ago, we had to really decodify documents which were shipped by airplane to know how to build a processing plant for fruits and to how to manufacture soap. Today, you can access that knowledge within two seconds. Uh, so the transaction costs are so much lower. That means the opportunities for, for creativity are so much higher. And that's really the beauty. And that's, I think, the good news, uh, that is access to opportunities, the barriers are so much lower. I think the old paradigm of north-south doesn't really hold anymore. Innovation is happening everywhere. Look at Brazil, most of the big social innovations are actually happening here, uh, from cash transfer to loose para todo, which are now making the round around the world. And I can quote you many other examples. This is the new world we live in. And social media, I believe, is part of it. And also companies, by the way, they have gone global. And that means you no longer have your traditional R&D protected somewhere in Massachusetts alone. No, you have your R&D now in Bangalore, in China, and everywhere else, because you want to source knowledge and know-how from everywhere. And that's spreading. That's great. Kumi. I just wanted to respond to uh, uh, George a bit there. While I agree with the, most of what you say, and I also agree with the point that I want to draw attention to, that in fact the old north-south dichotomies do not hold uh, exactly in the same way. I don't think they're irrelevant. Uh, I think they're really, really still the major driver of these negotiations. Uh, of course, it's different now because you've got big emerging countries like... Um, by the way, I hate this term, emerging countries. It's, uh, what are we? We always wear there, as if we suddenly emerged, right? But in any case, we all get trapped in the language. But countries that are finding their rightful place in the global economy, perhaps uh, the situation is different. But one of the questions that I want to put to you, because you know, I agree very much when you say we need to work in collaborative partnership and so on. But the difficulty that Greenpeace and other civil society organisations have, with both business and government, is that they seem to ignore what Albert Einstein once said. Albert Einstein said, if you're trying to fix a big problem, don't use the same logic thinking and frameworks that got you in the problem in the first place. And essentially, all that we see governments and business doing is putting a Band-Aid over the problem and hoping that it will go away. So I just, and, and just to be quite transparent, I mean, I get criticized from both sides. I get criticized sometimes by people saying Greenpeace should be engaging more with business. I get in, criticized from the other side saying Greenpeace should be even not talking to business at all. Uh, when I went to the World Economic Forum as the first time as a, in my Greenpeace hat, I was completely surprised because there were so many people from the CEOs wanted to meet me because when I used to go as a human rights and anti-poverty campaign and nobody wanted to actually sit down and have a conversation with me. So I, one CEO I got to a bit late, I said, I'm sorry, man, I'm, it's a new situation. Everybody has scheduled me and I'm running from one meeting to the other. He said, no, don't worry, Kumi, I understand the problem you have. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, everybody is desperate. All my CEOs are desperate to get uh, Greenpeace at the table because they hope that way they won't be on your menu. <laughs> but, 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 but seriously, I, I but, get your point. Yeah, but, but, but I have a more fundamental question to raise with you, right? Um, because, you know, I, I really support what you're trying to do, and you know this, we've talked for many years. But isn't there a real problem with the DNA of business? Because in the DNA of business is more profit, more markets, more products, more, you know, more, more, more. In fact, we need to actually shift that model, firstly, to do more with less. And I think enlightened, progressive business leaders have got that, that we need to do more with less. But simply doing more with less is not good enough. How do you deal with this contradiction of reducing meaningless production and consumption 
that the business community actually pushes down Tell the throat. I, I share your sense of uh, frustration on occasions. I'm very impatient myself. I believe there are two systemic deficiencies in the marketplace. One is the obsession with short-term returns, and we have discussed this uh, uh, at length. And how do you shift the signals from short-term to long-term is fundamentally important. If you make investment decisions based on 20 years projections, you integrate actually environmental considerations much more. If you think only about three months ahead, you don't care. You just want to make a quick buck. So one is time frame. Fundamentally difficult, and we're working on that, but the whole system, the old system, is geared on short-term, short-term, short-term. We have to change that. The second one is the valuation, and you talked about it already. It's true that market signals just don't integrate sufficiently the true costs, especially on the natural environment. We are still in the old paradigm, like everything is free and we can dump it and throw it away. It's no longer true. But that change is starting to happen, the pricing change. And we're working very hard to push for emission pricing, carbon pricing, and in the end, we need it. And we have to work towards a global framework at the end, and that's where climate change comes in, and we all know how painful it is. Now, business is moving, but is the pace fast enough? I would also agree, no, it's not. And you have to also understand that large corporations are very complex organizations. It's almost like a mini state in its own. So even when the CEO says, as of today, you know, I want to change my operations, until it reaches the subsidiaries and the supply chains, it's a long way to go. Think about, you know, reform of big organizations. So are we moving fast enough? No. Uh, are we doing enough? No. What can we do better? I would go back also to especially the consumers and the people, and I would say just uh, choose more carefully. Think about what you consume and how you consume. Think about what values you yourself are. are uh, for ex It sounds now a bit pathetic, but I, I turned vegetarian three years ago, and uh, I did it for health reasons more than anything else, but I, I, I'm also happy to know that this has a huge positive footprint. Yeah? So, and, wow. so we won't see you at Kentucky uh, Fried Chicken anytime yeah, no, soon? I, um, so we've got five minutes left. Let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about the future. I think one of the really interesting things about this conversation, and I think one of the thing, interesting things about social media, is social media is instinctively future tense. Social media, you speak to what Mashable calls the connected generation. They all talk about not what they should have done or what they did do. They talk about what they're going to do. They talk about the next 20 years. And in the sense of the conversations I've been having with, with people here locally, they're all about people looking forward. And actually, it's a really interesting counter-narrative about people thinking not Rio plus 20, but today plus 20. You know, today plus 20, what are we going to get right for the next 20 years? So in the, in the last five minutes we've got together, let's talk a little bit about, particularly given the wide experience you guys have in terms of making the world a better place, what should the people now beginning their careers in social good, what should they be thinking about as they're trying to put right the things in the next 20 years, the things you think we haven't got right in the last 20 years? Well, first, I think young people should not vest any faith in the current brand of adult leadership that exists in the world. They should not accept that they are the leaders of tomorrow. They should assert that, in fact, they are the leaders of today and actually bring new vision and new ways and new imagination of addressing these problems. The problem is, as my daughter sometimes says to me when I say, darling, you should do this, she said, dad, based on my experience, you should do this. She said, dad, you are contaminated by bad experience and you push it onto us. And that's what's happening. I, I, I want to be blunt. The current leadership, see, 20 years ago, maybe the evidence was not clear about how serious things are. The evidence now is very clear. It's not as if climate impacts are not happening and taking lives now. Right? It's happening now, and the people that are paying the first and most brutal price are those that have been least responsible. So given that reality, I would safely say that the current bunch of adult leadership is the biggest bunch of losers that young people are going to find. My main message to you is come up with new ideas, imagine a new world, and do not be restricted by the current frames of thinking, because the current frames of thinking are going to lead us to disaster, and we need fresh thinking. That's the one important thing. The second thing is fight for your spaces for your voice. 
And be careful to make the distinction between access versus influence. What I mean is like a, there are young people here at Rio. There are people who got registration and so on. And just because we're inside with some level of access doesn't mean we have influence. So the one thing I would say is think carefully about what constitutes real access and what constitutes influence and focus on those things that give you more space to have influence. Okay, Org, I'm going to give you the last word. Yeah, what's, no. what's the one piece of advice for the next 20 years? Look for wisdom. I wouldn't restrict it just to young people. I'm thinking of my dead grandmother, who probably was the best environmental steward I have ever come across. I'm thinking of many very wise people, yesterday Maurice Strong, but all over the world. I hope we learn also from the past. I hope we don't forget the lessons of the past. Of course, we have to look for innovations and new things, and my advice is also look into technology. I do believe that innovation and technology is a big, part of the answer for the future. So don't forget the sciences, uh, the hard sciences as well. Thank you so much, uh, Kubi and Gorg. The, the, the future is wiser, the future is more social. That was a great start to our day. Thanks for joining us.